Okay, and welcome back to Psychology with Mr. Snyder. Uh, you may be wondering, where's Mr. Snyder? I don't see him on the screen today. Well, sometimes I'll be uh, viewable. Other times, if I have a lot of notes to look over or such, I will not be because it'll just be distracting to you. So this is one of those days. But today, we're going to combine two of my favorite things, history and psychology, to go over the history of psychology. And let's go ahead and get started. Here are your learning targets for the day. We're going to talk about some early, early views being BC times, uh, or BCE, the politically correct way of saying it, the before common era, views and beliefs about human behavior. And then we'll talk about uh, the early pioneers of psychology starting in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, and we'll talk about ways that they thought. So, early views. Uh, psychology is relatively new. It's only been around for about 130, 140 years. Um, but before that, I mean, we had philosophers, we had medical doctors, and physiologists, or people who study the physical workings of the body. Uh, we had people like Aristotle, who wrote about the relationship of the soul to the body. Uh, we had Plato, who felt that the soul could exist separately from the body. Uh, we had Descartes, a French philosopher and math uh, mathematician who agreed with Plato and believed that the pineal gland, um, which we'll talk about when we get to the brain, was the seat of the soul. But it's been around for quite a while. People have thought about how the mind works, what makes people behave the way they do. Uh, Socrates developed introspection, something that we will build upon, which is carefully examining your own thoughts and feelings. And Aristotle, as mentioned before, is known for associationism, or basically our mental activity comes from past experiences. And you would say, duh, of course, but that wasn't common knowledge at that time, and somebody actually had to come up with that principle. Uh, during the Middle Ages, um, a lot of the Greek knowledge was lost, um, and that's why it's called the Dark Ages, because we didn't have a lot of original thought going on. Most Europeans thought that the psychological problems uh, were caused by demons and somebody being possessed, and they performed exorcisms to try to uh, keep these people from being possessed. They also used certain tests to determine whether a person was possessed or not. One of my favorites being... Um, tying a person to rocks and throwing them in a lake because witches could float they could use their magic to float and so if they float they are a witch but unfortunately if they don't float okay the good news is they're not a witch bad news is they're dead so it didn't make a lot of sense it was basically a death sentence to have that test carried out on you Um, so getting to learning target two, some early pioneers of psychology. The father of modern psychology is Wilhelm Wundt. Wilhelm Wundt. He establishes the first, what is considered the first psychological laboratory in Leipzig, Germany. And he comes up with the psychological view or theory of structuralism. And structuralism basically focuses on the main elements of consciousness. And consciousness being different than human thought, but this is how it began. In his laboratory, students from around the world were taught to study the structure of the human mind. Wundt believed that the mind was made up of thoughts, experiences, emotions, and other basic elements of this consciousness. In order to inspect these non-physical elements, students had to learn to think objectively about their own thoughts. After all, they could hardly read someone else's mind, so Wundt called this process objective introspection, or the process of objectively examining and measuring one's own thoughts and mental activities. For example, Wundt might take an object, like a rock or something, into a student's hand and have the student tell him everything that he was feeling as a result of having that rock in his hand. All the sensations that he felt with the rock. So it's heavy, it's rough, it's hard, 
all of those things that he was feeling. These are really the first attempts ever, this may seem stupid to you, but these are really the first attempts ever to bring um, objectivity and measurements to the concept of psychology. And that's why he's known as the father of psychology. So basically how to remember structuralism, they believe the human mind functions by combining objective sensations and subjective feelings. All right, the other, one of the other early views of psychology was known as functionalism. And William James comes up with functionalism. So unlike Boone, James was more interested in studying the importance of consciousness to everyday life than he was in actually analyzing consciousness. He thought that the study, the scientific study of consciousness itself was not yet possible. Conscious ideas are constantly flowing in an ever-changing stream, and once you start thinking about what you were just thinking about, what you were thinking about is no longer what you were thinking about, it's what you are thinking about, and, excuse me, think you get the picture? Uh, J so James focuses on how the mind allows people to function, root word of functionalism, in the real world. How do people work, play, and adapt to their surroundings. He's really influenced by Darwin's uh, theory of natural selections, or natural selection, in which physical traits that help an animal adapt to its environment and survive are passed on to its offspring, becoming a part of the animal's traits. Animal and people whose behavior helped them to survive would pass those traits on to their offspring, perhaps by teaching or even by some mechanism of heredity. So, avoiding the eyes of others in an elevator can be seen as a way of protecting one's personal space, a kind of territorial protection that may have its roots in the primitive need to protect one's home and source of food and water from intruders, or as a way of avoiding what might seem like a challenge to another person. You, you know you do it. Nobody just gets into an elevator and stares at other people. That might be why. Now we're going to move on to the granddaddy of them all, Sigmund Freud and his psychoanalysis theory. Freud, you've all heard of him. Uh, Freud is in our common vernacular, such as Freudian slip, um, saying something that you were thinking but that you didn't mean to say. Freud is one of the most famous of the early psychologists, and his theories still have heavy... Um, influence on what we study today in psychology, but his, perspe his perspective is called psychoanalysis, which emphasizes these unconscious motives. So things that you're not even thinking about right now and that aren't even accessible by your conscious mind, those conflict with society's rules and social norms in human behavior and that's what causes problems. So Freud was a physician, he's from Austria, and the structuralists are arguing, the functionalists are specializing. Freud basically is a medical doctor and he sought to help his patients. So he wanted to apply this to the problems of mental health. His patients suffered from nervous disorders uh, that had no physical cause, therefore he thought the cause must be in the mind. And that's where Freud began to explore. He said that there's the unconscious mind into which we push all of our threatening urges and desires. And that's called repression. And we'll get to more of that later. That'll be a common theme in our class. He believed that these repressed urges, when they try to surface into the conscious mind, create the nervous disorders uh, that we have. He also stresses the importance of early childhood experiences, believing that personality is formed in the first six years of a person's life. If there are significant problems, those problems had to have begun in the early years. Finally, we get into the 1900s. Freud worked in the 1900s, but so did Watson and Skinner. They basically had grown tired of the arguing among the structuralists 
and the functionalist viewpoint and psychoanalysis and he basically turns behavior into a science he said we can't know what our conscious mind is thinking truly and objectively that's not possible so that all what psychology needs to focus on is observable behavior and that's why his um, theory is called behaviorism Watson wants to bring psychology to focus on scientific inquiry and he felt that the only way to do that was to ignore consciousness and focus on observable behavior what can be seen and measured for example he holds that people can be totally conditioned or made to act certain ways by external events and that anything you believe in individual choice or free will is just an illusion everything you do is because of things that have happened to you in your past observable things and Skinner adds to this with the idea of reinforcement and we'll get to reinforcement and punishment but you're made to do things through being reinforced or rewarded for certain actions uh, think of dog training if you train a dog and they do something correct you give them a treat they are more likely to do that again and people learn in the same ways that animals do finally we have gestalt psychology and it's an alternative to the behaviorism and structuralism and even the functionalism basically its founders and you're not going to need to know all their names but the founders of uh, gestalt psychology basically say that psychological events such as perceiving uh, or sensing could not be broken down into any smaller elements and still be properly understood and to give you an analogy you can take apart a computer but then you no longer have a computer you have a pile of unconnected parts and pieces and circuit boards that don't do anything on their own a melody in a song is made up of individual notes that can only be understood if the notes are in the correct relationship to one another so therefore perception can only be understood as a whole entire event and come here in comes the slogan the whole is greater than the sum of its parts the Gestalt psychologists believe that people naturally seek out patterns or holes in the sensory information available to them. For example, here you see the example from your book. In drawing A, are the two dark blue circles the same size? And the answer is yes, but do they look the same size? In relation to the other parts of that drawing on the left, the dark blue circle is smaller in the one on the right in drawing a it looks bigger in relation to the other ones but they are actually the same size and in drawing B what is the second symbol in each row right here it looks like a letter B because it is surrounded by letters right here it looks like 13 because it is surrounded by numbers Two images that are identical may appear to be different if their surroundings are different. And so just to review a little bit, here we have Wundt and James. And I'll let you read that over yourself. These are also in your book, but they're nice little uh, tabbed files about each person. And here are Freud, Watson, and Skinner. So I hope you enjoyed today's assignment. And I will be looking forward to getting into the modern views of psychology with you next time. Thanks and goodbye.